Okay, thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone. I will indeed talk about the blood CSF barrier, which is maybe a structure that you're not uh, all familiar with. So, a short introduction about that. Um, if you look to the brain, this is how it looks. So, you have all these capillaries. Um, however, it's very dangerous that uh, blood would leak into the brain. So, therefore, to prevent this, um, there is the presence of the blood-brain barrier. Um, and... Um, the blood-brain barrier, as most of you probably know it, uh, is located uh, at the uh, border uh, between the capillaries and the brain and is formed by endothelial cells. So these endothelial cells, they uh, have tight junctions and this prevents free leakage from the blood into the brain. However, there are also other brain barriers which are much less uh, studied. And there are uh, barriers in the eye, uh, at the level of the spinal cord, at the level of the uh, arachnoid barrier. But the one that we are looking uh, into is located over here and is called the blood CSF barrier. So where is it located? If you look to a section of the brain, inside our brain we have these ventricles and these ventricles are filled with CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. And here, what you see here on this picture, this is the structure we are focusing on and where the blood CSF barrier is located. And this one, this structure is called the choroid plexus. This is how it looks. So it's a, a branched-like structure um, that is hanging inside the ventricles of the brain. So again, the brain, the ventricles, which are filled with the cerebral spinal fluid. And this is a, a movie uh, in a human patient. And what you will see is inside these ventricles, so inside this uh, structure. And the structure over here that you will see uh, uh, moving is the choroid plexus. So over here, and this is this structure. So you nicely saw that this was really moving um, um, due to the uh, fluid uh, movement uh, uh, in the ventricles. Um, how does it look, look um, uh, schematically? Uh, this is one of these uh, branches. This is the ventricular space where you have the uh, CSF. And here you have the brain tissue that starts. And here you also have a border of uh, cells called ependymal cells. Um, so this is the uh, choroid plexus tissue. Uh, you also have capillaries in the choroid plexus tissue, but there, in contrast to this classical BBB that you uh, probably uh, are familiar with, there are no tight junctions between the endothelial cells, which means that blood, which is inside these capillaries, can freely leak out of the capillaries and reach these cells. But as I mentioned, it's quite uh, dangerous that blood could uh, freely leak into, into the brain. So there is another barrier present. And this is located over here. And this one is called the blood CSF barrier. And it's formed by epithelial cells. Here, in this case, now you have these nice tight junctions. So these cells are tightly connected by the presence of tight junctions. And they form this uh, barrier. If you look uh, to these cells uh, by electron microscopy, you see that they have uh, microvilli at the apical side. They are in close contact with this fenestrated, this leaky capillaries, which you see here. So this is one cell, you have the nucleus, and you also see all these mitochondria, so all these black dots. So then a 3D reconstruction of uh, this, uh, these cells. So these are, uh, this is one cell, and then you have an, an adjacent cell. You have the capillaries. And this shows that these cells are really located between, or uh, a unique cell layer between the blood, so the capillaries, and the brain. And if you look to it um, by uh, a 3D uh, reconstruction, but the movie doesn't work. So normally you see this 3D reconstruction of the cell. So one cell and then a nice uh, slide uh, uh, through the cell. What is here again uh, obvious from this um, uh, image is that here you have this wrinkling of the membrane. And this is a, a mechanism or a way to enhance the surface area between the blood and the cells. And this is because these cells are um, important in transporting actively things from the brain, uh, blood into the brain. And that, all, that is also why the, they have all these mitochondria, because they use a lot of energy. So they are very important in transporting molecules from the blood into the brain. In my talk today, I will focus on the barrier function that they have and also on their secretory activity because these cells are responsible for most of the CSF production um, and by doing that, they influence uh, brain homeostasis. So you're familiar with Alzheimer's disease and the different uh, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. It was already mentioned before, so you have the A-beta plaques, you have the tangles. 
Um, and recently, uh, also the importance of neuroinflammation, as mentioned in the previous talk, was also uh, stressed. And it, it appears that the plaques, which you all uh, know, um, there you have uh, uh, all this um, uh, A-beta, which uh, sticks together. But there is an earlier form of A-beta, which is called A-beta oligomers. And these are still soluble. And those are the oligomers that really cause the neuroinflammation. So this is what we are focusing on. And we mimic this in mouse models by injecting this soluble A-beta oligomers in the ventricles of the brain. And this is what we do. So we inject it in the ventricles of the brain. And then we do, for example, a novel object recognition tests. So you have the mice, you train them first, and then you check whether they have a preference for the novel object. This is in healthy conditions. You have you see that they have preference for the novel object. However, when they are injected with this A-beta oligomers, this reduces um, their preference, so their cognition is impaired. But what about the barrier function of the choroid plexus epithelial cells of this blood CSF barrier? So what we did is this, we used this model. We injected the mice with A-beta oligomers. And then you can check how the barrier is functional. So what you do is you in inject Fitzdextrain IV. And then you check whether or not this is able to cross the blood CSF barrier. So we isolate CSF for that. And as shown here, this is control mice. This is uh, mice injected with A-beta oligomers. This induces more leakage of this Fitzdex strain into the brain. So A-beta oligomers are able to induce blood CSF barrier leakage. And here you see a comparison of a cell of a control mouse. So this is the epithelial cell. And here you see the epithelial cell of an A-beta injected mice. And again, the movies don't work, but you already see it on this image. You have this uh, cuboidal uh, cell, and here you see that the cell loses its morphology. So we have been interested in MMPs for a long, long time, and they, they are really important in both uh, physiological and uh, pathophysiological uh, conditions. And what we noticed is that if we checked our uh, tissue, that there was more MMP activity present in the tissue upon presence of A-beta oligomers. And then, of course, we tried to inhibit that. There are different MMP inhib inhibitors available. And we were able to, so this is the leakage increased in response to A-beta oligomers. And we could almost completely reverse this by the presence of an MMP inhibitor. However, MMP inhibition, since they play a role in physiological and pathophysiological conditions, is not a good choice to go for as a therapy. So we wanted to look upstream what can cause or which molecules are upstream of MMPs. And using human data of corrupt choroid plexus tissue of Alzheimer's patients and uh, controls and performing pathway analysis on uh, this, uh, these data. We observed that if you look uh, to the molecules which are upstream of the genes that are uh, regulated, we noticed that we could detect uh, TNF here. Uh, and all these genes downstream or most of those genes were indeed upregulated in our uh, sequencing uh, data. So, uh, if we then went back to our mouse models, so you have different mouse models. Here are a beta oligomer injection, but of course you can also use the transgenic mouse models. And indeed we noticed that TNF, TNF receptor 1 signaling, was upregulated uh, in these mouse models. Um, Moreover, we uh, use the same models to genetically um, deplete TNF receptor 1, so really blocking the TNF-TNF receptor 1 signaling. And in both cases, so this is in the genetic model, here you see an increase, for example, in inflammation uh, when the mice uh, have Alzheimer's disease. However, this is completely absent when they don't have this TNF receptor 1 expressed. Same in the other model, so this is the scrambled condition. In response to A-beta oligomers, there is more inflammation, and this is uh, partially blocked uh, in the absence of TNF receptor 1 uh, signaling. In the lab, um, oh, and this is also uh, importantly associated with cognitive function, because of course this is the important readout. So this is a novel object recognition test. Healthy mice, they perform good. Uh, transgenic um, Alzheimer's mice, they don't have a preference anymore. And you see if there is TNF receptor 1 deficiency that they do perform well in the test. Also in the other model, the same effect. So loss of uh, preference, so cognitive decline. And this can be rescued, rescued if um, there is deficiency in the TNF receptor 1. 
In the lab, we've been working on nanobodies, so you might uh, be familiar with uh, those uh, molecules. So this is a, a normal antibody, so it has a, a heavy chain and a light chain. Uh, but some animals have heavy chain only uh, antibodies. They look like this, and an example is the alpaca. Um, and this part, this is the part which is responsible for the antigen recognition, and it's called uh, the VHH domain, or this is what is called the nanobody. So the advantage is it's very small, so it can reach, um, if you look to the biodistribution, it will be um, uh, better uh, distributed uh, throughout uh, the tissues. And you can also easily express it. We've published several things about a nanobody that specifically blocks the TNF receptor 1, uh, and uh, really blocks the signaling um, and we've tested in uh, different diseases so we also tested it here in our Alzheimer's uh, model and we call it TROS uh, because of the TNF receptor 1 silencer uh, capacity so that's our nanobody that we have used and so we used it in our model so a beta oligomer injection with or without our uh, treatment so our TROS treatment and this indeed uh, protected against the cognitive de decline so the control mice if we uh, inject them with a beta oligomers, you have the cognitive decline, and this can be uh, prevented if we inject the mice with our uh, na uh, nanobody, so uh, TROS. But next to the barrier function, this other important um, uh, feature of these cells is also really important, and that's the secretory capacity. Um, uh, if you talk about secretion, this is, also, this is of course uh, uh, protein, soluble proteins, but also other things can be secreted and, for example, extracellular vesicles. There are different types of extracellular vesicles and literature is quite complex, but just shortly uh, a bit um, a description of the different types. So these are the exosomes. They are in general a bit smaller. Um, and what is important is that uh, uh, they are produced like this. So you have MVBs, multivesicular bodies. Then this fuses with the membrane and then you have the release of the exosomes. Another type are the microvesicles. Uh, the biogenesis is completely different. They are formed by budding off from the membrane. They are a bit smaller, but there's a lot of overlap, so size is not uh, the good way to discriminate between the different types. And then, of course, you have apoptotic bodies. Uh, when a cell uh, goes, uh, undergoes apoptosis, it can result in, in, in uh, vesicles. These vesicles are generally bigger, but again, there's overlap with the other types. Why are they so important? Originally, it was thought that they um, are just formed uh, by a cell to get rid of uh, proteins that they don't want anymore, so as a kind of garbage mechanism. However, it became clear the last years that they are really essential in cell-to-cell -cell communication. So they are taken up by a target cell, and the mechanism of uptake is quite complex and still uh, something that is under investigation. But what is, of course, important is the content of the vesicles. These vesicles contain lipids, proteins, metabolites, um, ions, everything can be detected in these vesicles and you can um, uh, assume and, and it has been shown that these vesicles by delivering their content to the target cell that they can have a huge impact on these target cells. Of course these, cells ca these vesicles can travel via long distances so uh, a cell in, at one place can uh, have an impact on an, an other cell. So we've seen before, and we published that a few years ago, that um, in case of systemic inflammation, so uh, inflammation coming from the periphery, in this case uh, sepsis, so if it comes from this side, we were looking on the impact on the choroid plexus epithelial cells. We saw that if we look to the cerebrospinal fluid, so uh, this is inside the cerebrospinal fluid, that we could detect vesicles in there. Moreover, if we looked at different time points and if we quantified the amount of vesicles, we saw that there was an increase. So injection of LPS, so systemic inflammation, induces more vesicles in the cere uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And then if we looked closely to the choroid plexus epithelial cells, this is this choroid plexus epithelial cell. You again see the capillary, the CSF site, the nucleus, the mitochondria. And if you look closely here, you see these MVBs that I've mentioned before, and those are the ones that are important in this exosome secretion. And this is in minus LPS conditions, so uh, control conditions. If the mice have inflammation, there are may way more MVBs fully packed with exosomes. So clearly, Inflammation has an impact on this process. So we also looked to our A-beta oligomer, 
uh, oligomer um, uh, setup. Um, so mice were injected with a beta oligomers, and again we saw an increase in amount of vesicles that we could detect in the cerebrospinal fluid, and also the choroid plexus epithelial cells had some, I just show one example, uh, typical markers that were highly expressed in response uh, to um, uh, A-beta oligomers, which are linked to this vesicular production. For example, here, RAP5, in healthy conditions or in normal conditions, it's present at the uh, basal site, while in uh, A-beta oligomer conditions, it's really expressed at the apical site and in a punctuated pattern typical for these uh, MVBs. But of course, we want to look what the impact of these vesicles is. So we used an inhibitor which is able to block this process. So this inhibitor um, prevents the last step of this exosome production. So it blocks the MVB fusion with the membrane. And so you don't have this uh, secretion anymore. This was effective, so we have the A-beta-induced increase in vesicle production. If we use this inhibitor, there are less vesicles produced. And uh, strikingly, if we then test the mice, this completely protects against the A-beta-induced cognitive decline. So you see this reduction in um, uh, preference in case of A-beta oligomers, as I've mentioned before, but you uh, see protection in case of uh, using this inhibitor. What about another process, caloric restriction? So we performed a caloric restriction experiment on these mice. So mice were put on this diet for three weeks. They were injected with our A-beta oligomers, and then we analyzed them via uh, different uh, tests. So first, to see the impact on the vesicle production. So this is the increase in vesicle production, as I've shown before. If we put the mice on caloric restriction, this completely blocks the A-beta-induced vesicle production. And as you probably know, is also protected against the A-beta induced or the Alzheimer's linked uh, cognitive decline. So here you see the cognitive decline in the ad libitum mice and you don't see this in the uh, CR uh, mice. So clearly there is an, 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 a correlation between um, the EV production and uh, cognitive uh, decline. With that, um, I come to my uh, conclusion. So in case of neuroinflammation, for example, in uh, Alzheimer's disease, we see that there's an impact on barrier integrity, and we were able to show that this can be inhibited by using MMP inhibitors, but also by using our TROS nanobody that blocks TNF, TN, TNF receptor 1 signaling. Additionally, we also saw an increase in secretory activity, and this can be blocked either by the GW4869, so the inhibitor of exosome secretion, and also by caloric uh, restriction. With that, I, of course, have to thank uh, my uh, team. So this is the current composition of my team. The work I presented was mainly performed by uh, Charisse. Um, also two uh, ex-members who played an important role in the data that I showed and they get uh, uh, good uh, technical assistance by two uh, lab technicians. And of course I also have to thank uh, uh, the funding and uh, several of our collaborators. And of course I'm willing to answer any question. Thank you very much. So, questions? Yes. Actually, two questions. First is, uh, I would assume that uh, the the enhanced production of of EVs under both the a, the a beta and the pro inflammatory interventions might at least in part be due by induction of a senescence or senescence-like phenotype in yeah. those uh, uh, choroid plexus cells? Did yeah. you test that? Uh, yeah, so we performed, for example, a proteomics on, on the vesicles. And um, um, uh, at least if you look at, uh, but I think I have uh, some uh, data there. So um, if you look uh, to... Um, it's not uh, senescence, but um, uh, the reason why I show it here is um, so we uh, performed proteomics on, on the vesicles, so on the content, mm -hmm. because we uh, really wonder what, because these are the vesicles that induce this cognitive decline, so if yeah. you know what is in there, you of course know yeah. where to yeah. interfere. 
And if you uh, look to the proteins which are specific for the um, uh, A-beta situation, those are the pathways that come up. And of course, several of them, and you also see here mTOR yeah, signaling. Yeah. Yeah, so um, things are linked. Um, unfortunately, we uh, also tested, for example, rapamycin and, and, and different compounds, but none was able to uh, mimic the effect of the caloric restriction itself. Uh, so we uh, don't know right now what the exact mechanism is. Yeah. And the, the other question is probably more my, my misunderstanding, but you, so the interventions you've, you've shown, they are systemic. No, S no not all of them. The nanobody was delivered the, 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 uh, immediately yes. in the brain. No, okay, but okay, ah, let's, let's call it yeah. brain systemic. Yeah. So what is your evidence for a specific role of the choroid plexus mm -hmm. here? Yeah, um, it's still something that is difficult to um, study. So for years we are already investing in a Cree um, mouse that is specific for the choroid plexus epithelial cells. We now finally have one. Um, and indeed we really want to show the contribution of the epithelial cells. But of course you have to keep in mind that... Um, you have the choroid plexus uh, uh, epithelium cells. In there, you also have all these inflammatory cells. And of course, they can also produce a lot of different uh, molecules. And if we, for example, perform uh, flow analysis on choroid plexus tissue, there's a huge influx uh, of inflammatory cells in response to both neuroinflammation and systemic inflammation. Yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, what do you think about the work of Ed Tabinik with Etanercept? Um, uh, Etanercept is, of course, a TNF inhibitor, not a TNF receptor 1 inhibitor. And the reason why we target TNF receptor 1 signaling and not TNF is because TNF can signal via two different receptors, TNF receptor 1 and TNF receptor 2. So uh, TNF receptor 1... Um, is the pro-inflammatory one, while TNF receptor 2 is believed to be the one that is more neuroprotective. Um, and we really try to uh, look into these effects. For example, in the study with our TNF receptor uh, 1 knockout mice, we indeed saw that uh, TNF receptor 2 signaling was not affected, um, which we believe uh, is uh, more neuroprotective rather than uh, pro-inflammatory. So that's why I think targeting TNF receptor 1 rather than the upstream TNF TNF is a better approach. Can I ask just a quick follow-up question about the caloric restriction? 40% is a hell of a caloric restriction. How long did it go on for and Three which weeks. gender? Three weeks. Okay, and uh, th this was in males, I assume? In males, yeah. Okay, did you look to see how the massive systemic stress response was going to affect your data? Um, we had four groups uh, available, so the ad libitum um, uh, control and A-beta and then the uh, caloric restricted uh, mice. We have performed uh, RNA analysis on different tissues and also metabolomics uh, analysis. Um, and there is an, um, an influence on general uh, stress response. Um, but we are really trying to figure out which part is um, different between um, uh, is solely uh, caused by the A-beta oligomer effects and really results in the protection. Uh, but there is indeed a kind of uh, stress response for sure. Yeah. We have time for one more question. So, yeah, sure. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, do you remember what type of MMP where you were playing with? Yeah. yeah. So we looked at different MMPs. Um, we uh, on on RNA level because on protein level it's a bit bit tricky. Uh, they are so similar that none of the antibodies is really specific. Um, and MMP3 was the one that was the most upregulated. And we confirmed part of our results in MMP3 knockout mice. However, um, I want to stress that those MMP3 knockout mice, later on it was discovered that they also have an, an, a passenger mutation, uh, which is uh, caspase 4. Um, and uh, this is involved in IL-1 beta signaling. And for example, our human data shows that IL-1 beta is also quite important in the process. So I'm, I'm not sure we, we now have good MMP3 mice and, and we want to look what the impact is. Uh, but in, in our study, and it's published, we've shown that it's MMP3 uh, mainly. But there are other ones uh, uh, also upregulated. Okay, thank you very much.
Thank you.